Welcome to the uh, second PBL uh, symposium uh, in the context of this uh, wonderful BNL Urban by Nature. My name is Martin Heyer. I'm the Director General of uh, PBL. Um, today we have uh, a few invited guests, and I'm really privileged, uh, and we are all very privileged uh, to have them here for people who uh, contribute to an international debate on what is now very much an international uh, discussion. What are we going to do with our cities? Um, it's also the, the day, and I'm uh, very, very happy, that we are going to present our new book, Smart About Cities, from which I will speak in uh, the launch, actually, of this, uh, this mini-conference uh, here today. Um, we have in our program first a presentation by me and then we have a tabled conversation with the, the people uh, that you see now up on the screen and I will uh, introduce them uh, later on. But let me first move to the, the talk I would like to give if you could provide me with the sheets. We live in a period of transition. There are signs that we realize that going on in, on the business as usual trajectory is going to lead us to disaster. We are building windmills in the Netherlands. We are planning them. And we do also realize that this comes with transition pain. But that that transition is something we need is now evidently also something that is accepted by policymakers. So the Green Week just a few weeks ago in the heart of the European Commission was on the circular economy. And everybody, any singular speaker, discussed circular economy in the way it should be discussed. But how to translate that into concepts that make the, 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 the world work differently, that is a very different matter. We have, after all, a trodden path, a way of organizing our mobility, our, our increasingly urban lives, that need to be rethink, rethought. This normalcy, our normalcy, cannot be normal any longer. It is no longer normal. It's producing too many negative side effects. Now, if there is one thing good about sushi, is that it suggests that you eat less and like it better. But the, the bulk food that we are sort of moving away from is definitely, evidently problematic. The way we generate electricity is deeply problematic, not only because of CO2, but also for its footprint on, on the crust of, of the earth. And we have actually delegated as citizens the solutions to these problems to our leaders, our political leadership, national leaders, that together in international conferences like the one in Copenhagen are chosen to find solutions. But this work of art, which is actually in a puddle in Berlin, uh, and is called Politicians Discussing Climate Change, shows the lack of confidence, or stands for the lack of confidence, that the united political leadership will produce those solutions in time. So that is why suddenly urban people, mayors, citizens, firms are regarded as the potential new agents of change. And this seminar is devoted to that very issue. Can urban people produce solutions for global problems? And it is a very political question because there are many candidates that suggest that indeed we can. And one of the candidate discourses is a discourse I would like to dwell on for just a few minutes which is called the smart city. And many of you must have come across this particular discourse. Smart cities are a sort of a way of converting our cities into something new, which makes them low energy, highly efficient, and therefore also part of the solution. But if you look at the suggested solution, you see that it is actually almost Im impossible to achieve. If, could it be true that if our cities would install smart city equipment, that we would lose the emissions that of, of, of 7.8 gigaton. 7.8 gigaton, for those of you who are not familiar with gigaton CO2, and I bet you must be working in the planning agency to be familiar with those sort of figures. Uh, that is roughly in between the 
annual emission of the US and China. And China is, of course, much higher, and the US is a bit lower. So could that be true, that cities could produce that sort of transition? I think it is highly questionable. I actually think it's too good to be true. And I think it has to do with a sort of an illusion that the application of a particular technological solution, namely ICT-driven so solutions, are regarded in a naive sort of way. I give you two elements that you always find in that discourse. The driverless vehicle, promoted also, of course, in the Netherlands as something we want to propel. We want to be first in introducing the driverless vehicle. And I think there is a lot to be said for the driverless vehicle, but it, is, it, it, it carries a promise it probably cannot care on its own. We need to unpack those technologies, and that's a task for academics and part of our discourse. The control room in Rio de Janeiro, now in operation, of course, in the World Championships, the idea that by applying ICT, you can actually control an urban system in terms of security, but also in terms of metabolisms, in terms of public service provision generally. I mean, it's a fantastic idea to enhance the efficiency of waste reduction, of course, but this is always going at the detriment of something else. There's another may maybe informal way of doing it or, or, or other less high-tech solutions. We have to look into those solutions to understand them and to give the bandwidth of what you could think. I mean, this is also smart city technology, providing rural areas in Africa with the first sort of shop that is lit also in the evening and, and shows you in informal settlements ways of, uh, of getting to goods at the time you may want them. Or here, and it's a project of uh, uh, Mark Swilling in, in Stellenbosch, the idea of pro producing and, and delivering off-grid solutions to people in the informal settlements, not only as a contribution to CO2 emission, of course, but as a contribution to social mobility as well. So let's think about these smart city effects. I mean, who are discussing those? Who are discussing the new smart cities? Are these the urban planners? Are these the development experts? Are these the people from, of industry? Is a shift moving away from urban planning that I think is worrying? You see also a shift to public-private partnerships. Cities no longer are able financially to deliver on the solutions. You get Innovation, you often see, is seen as very technological rather than, say, social innovative. It is not about organizing things differently. It's about applying appliances to the social system. And cities, of course, you must have come across that sentence, are seen as living labs. We are going to use them as a laboratory. And I think, actually, that's a very interesting idea, but I would like to know, of course, who runs the laboratory. Now, to give you uh, some sense of the alternative, I would plea for a smart urbanism. So my statement is, if you want something smart, it's a smart urbanism. And it is because I see a replay potentially, and that's narrated also in the book, of the ideas of the 20th century, the ideas of Corbusier, who after all also said he had a solution for the dirt of the 19th century urban uh, dwellings. The idea of using technology in architecture, in steel, in concrete, and in new ways of building that, that initially, of course, delivered. This is the uh, open air school for the healthy child in Amsterdam. It's a wonderful bis bit of innovation, and it definitely delivered on that dream. And ar arguably, that's the same true for Stuyvesant Town in, uh, in Manhattan. It's a fantastic neighborhood where, where people live relatively cheaply and very close to where, where everything happens. But by and large, Corbusier produced these sort of solutions. This is the Prit Ego building in St. Louis, which was bombed you know, a, a mere 10 years after it was constructed because it was unlivable. And I think that mistake has been made time and again in the Belmer, where after 20 years, the buildings were knocked down. And this is precisely what we do in the third run in the Global South. That is where we seem to still be in the intellectual tradition of 20th century modernism when we build cities. And that city indeed produces precisely the 20th century problems that we know we need to get away from. This is global air pollution in uh, Beijing, where people bring their children to hospitals, not with one at a time, but with 30, 50 at a time to get extra respiration support for babies. I mean, that is a, a, a world that has to stop. Eh? And we must think, and that's part of our conversation, 
Can we produce a leapfrog? Can we allow the global south the next phase of eco-friendly cities that allow the global south to avoid these mistakes? If we need something smart, the argument will be we need a smart urbanism, and I want to know more about what that could be. And that's the book, and this is the graphics that you will find in the solution, trying to also visualize the challenge ahead and also the solution. And part of our conversation will be about city-level decoupling, the idea that we can make them function just as well in terms of economic wealth, but with a far smaller footprint. What sort of things should we be thinking about? And Mark Swilling, who's who is among us, will say something about the infrastructure and the role of infrastructure and how crucial that is. This is not a peripheral conversation. This is the World Bank spotting metabolisms. The, the theme that for the Netherlands might be relatively new, talking about urban metabolisms, and I think this uh, Biennale is doing a great job in putting that on the agenda, is already in the heart of our economic think tanks and banks they realize that if you don't have a sense of your metabolism, your city is a liability. You may not be able to pay back the loans that you get because you don't know the risks you run. A city in control of its metabolism is a resilient city in that sense as well. And that's why we now start a phase of learning, global learning, where all cities need to use the same statistics so that we can compare how cities are doing, which city is using more fossil and which city is using yes. For what purpose are they using that? And it looks still very primitive and, and not over, over designed, that's for sure. But this is the start of a science for that new future. Infrastructure, I suppose, is then always going to be crucial because we cannot do it with little bits, or can we? But if it is about infrastructure, do realize that any piece of infrastructure comes with a default. It privileges some uses over others. If you're in London and you want to cycle, and perhaps Philip will touch upon it, although I'm sure he will have more sort of uh, intellectually appealing things to say as well. If you cycle in London, and I, I take it Philip occasionally does that, it's just very risky. It's politics, it's a political act, but the default of the streets of London are for the car. And also with rules, you create that environment. And governments should realize that they have a role to play in shifting a default. I think they underestimate the power they have in setting the default right. So everybody talks about behavioral economics. And then, interestingly, they pick up the nudge bit, the little shift, well, why don't you do that? But the big story about behavioral economics is that any system has a default. And if you set the default right, that is the preferred behavior that you actually get. So we need to think about new ways of learning, of organizing the academy again in such a way that it supports policymaking. How are we going to do that? What sort of knowledge do we need? Whom do we need to share it with? And I think the thrust of this book and the thrust of also what you see in the exhibition is that it now for the first time has to be a global endeavor. But can that be? Can we learn globally? Can what I plea for, can there be a globally networked urbanism? One where we learn across cities. And I think we must go way beyond meeting each other in the C40, in ICLE, and all the other sort of meeting places we have. We have to facilitate that learning. How are we going to do that? And we have excellent academics discussing that here with us today. So I think I'll leave it there to uh, allow us immediately to go into the conversation. We have about two hours. And we envisage it to be a staged conversation there with, with four topics that will be introduced by uh, the successive speakers. Um, and if you think you can contribute, if there are things that you have in mind that help the conversation go further, please feel free, raise your hand, and try to uh, organize you into the conversation. You will be provided with a microphone. So let me therefore now first ask our uh, guests uh, to uh, come to the stage. First of all, uh, Mark Swilling from uh, Stellenbosch. He's a, a, a professor 
of Urban Studies Sustainability. He's a member of the International Resource Panel. Very glad that you're with us here. Philip Roder from LSE Cities. Philip is one of the masterminds behind LSE Cities, which organizes something that I think is really cutting edge, uh, the urban age, which is an academic endeavor to get cities, first of all, to understand the tasks ahead. They coined the phrase the urban age, but also to get them to learn in a, in a more productive way. And I'm very glad you uh, could make it as well. Yojita Gupta from the University of Amsterdam, professor of development and environment, who is a specialist in, in climate change, but also in, in cities in the global south. Uh, and finally, John Uri from the University of Lancaster. And as I said, John Uri is, when I started to uh, reorganize my bookshelves, is responsible for at least half a shelf of books. Um, and that is since I started to follow him. John Uri, uh, glad you could make it. He wrote about uh, mobility recently and um, far more recently, just two months ago, he published a book on offshoring, on the whole reorganization of the global production chain. So let us now switch to the handheld mic. And let me ask, uh, first of all, Mark um, to, con to contribute. Um, as I said, glad that you're here. Uh, I had the privilege of visiting you in, uh, in South Africa a couple of months ago. Um, I know you stand on the issue of infrastructure, but could you say, first of all, something about what you see coming towards Africa in terms of urbanization and that whole metabolic challenge we are discussing? We have a microphone, actually. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I slightly rethought what I was going to say today in light of a, where I was last week. I was in Accra with my wife, Eve, and we visited a place called Agboblashi, which the uh, Green Cross uh, in Switzerland rated in a report recently as one of the 10 most polluted sites in the world, on the planet. And it's a site which concentrates enormous quantities of plastic, and informal recyclers uh, reprocess this material and send it back out into the city and into international uh, circuits. And so the definition of the space as the most polluted ignores what's, under, what, what's underneath that label. A whole network of people who are constructing urban spaces in certain ways. So for me, that is, that's the story I want you to hold. Because the first point I want to make is that we all know that we're in the midst of the second urbanization wave. The first urbanization wave between 1750 and 1950 resulted in the urbanization of roughly 400 million people in the developed uh, north. The second urbanization wave has more or less started in the 1950s, lasting about 80 years, and is supposed to see the urbanization of roughly uh, 4 billion people, mainly in the global south. Now what this means, using UN data, is that uh, only 48% of the urban fabric that is supposed to exist by 1950 existed by 2010. In other words, a couple of hundred years of building cities is going to be almost doubled in the short space of four decades. And what's interesting is that nobody has asked the question, what are the resource requirements of this massive catapult into almost doubling, or more than doubling, the extent of urban living on, on the planet? Martin and I are part of a, of a research project uh, commissioned by the International Resource, uh, Resource Panel to, to answer that question. But just think of one little number. The amount of cement that was used in China over the last three years was more than the total amount of cement used by the United States in the 20th century. Fast forward that number across the world and you, you come up against some very frightening numbers, especially when you start considering what's going on in Africa. Africa now has a population, an urban population of roughly 400 million people. That means there are more people living in cities in Africa now than in North America, than in Europe, than in Latin America. And yet the projections are that this is going to go up to 1.2 billion people over the next four decades. In other words, another 800 million Africans living in cities. At the moment, there are a billion people living in Africa. It has the installed electrical generation capacity equal to France. 
it's growing at between 5 and 7% GDP. Uh, and the seven of the, of the fastest growing economies in the world now are African economies. So if Africa wants to secure its right to develop, to use the global jargon, uh, it's going to have to electrify. It's going to have to energize. If it does that using business as usual technologies, i.e. fossil fuels, coupled to AC grids, then the chances of the world achieving global climate targets are zero. The, 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 the problem no longer because is China, although that is the big problem from the, if, you look at, if, you, if, you, if you think CO2 should be measured in country terms, not per capita. Africa becomes a huge challenge. The whole world has an interest in making sure that Africa does not uh, energize using business as usual technologies. So that raises an interesting question. That what we see breaking out uh, uh, all over the place, especially in the private sector, is a whole bunch of new reports on urban infrastructure investment. The big game, the big game of the future is supposed to be put your money into urban infrastructures, whether it's the Boston Consulting Group, the Booz, Booz Allen Group, Siemens, uh, Cemex, uh, IBM. It's all the same story. Put your money into urban, in, urban infrastructures. The, what the latest Siemens report is called, wait for it, is your city investor ready? Say that again. Is your city investor ready? In other words, I mean, not is your city ready for people. I mean, that's uh, well, who, who lives there? Who lives there? Uh, uh, is your city ready, uh, investor ready? Okay, and uh, I, Martin's article uh, in this book, this wonderful book that is brought out, equating this, this, this citywide agenda of urban restructuring or using IT equivalent to the highway movement of the 50s or the sanitation movement of the 19th century, I think is spot on. So how do we explain this? Why is there this, this new focus on investment in urban infrastructure? I think we can link it to the global financial crisis. I think we can look at, for, look to, look at, it, uh, look at it in terms of the fact that this is a sovereign debt crisis at the same time that corporates have, 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 have are, are, are scoring uh, uh, profits not seen since the 1960s. There's a whole bunch of uh, spare cash sloshing around the global economy which has to go somewhere. The rise of the shadow banking movement to kind of redirect that into long-term investments in places where economic growth is actually happening. Uh, hey, where do you put your money? Urban infrastructure. So I think it's about mopping up the spare cash finding places to dump a bit like petrodollars in the 1970s. So the question that this raises for me uh, is what kind of cities are these invest do these investments have in mind? What kind of urban infrastructures? Who's going to spec uh, these, in these infrastructures? And I think one of the things that we need to, one of the challenges that we need to face is that during the neoliberal era, uh, that, le that led up to the global financial crisis. The state facilitated the escape of the market from society. And I think that one of the challenges we face in rebuilding, especially with a focus on, 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 on cities, is how we break from this emphasis on commodification, cost recovery, and start to think about cities in the developing world and in the developing world as spaces where we re-embed, we recapture uh, the market uh, for the sake of a new cityness, for a new urbanism. And how do we do that? I think we remain hopeful. We think we remain hopeful about cities as spaces of, 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 of freedom for basically two, two reasons today at this, at this moment in time. One is the more familiar narrative that cities somehow concentrate the intellectual, the relational, and the capital resources for innovation, because we all recognize that actually that's going to be the key driver. But I think the second, and I think we ignore the second at our peril, cities also potentially are where the social coalitions for re-embedding the market exist. These two need to come together. So if your city is only interested in being investor ready, you have completely failed to understand the real creative energy of urbanism. So 
we, f we are, in that sense, at an extraordinary moment. We have, we have the potential. We have the potential to explore this moment, utilize the opportunity, but we could lose it. We must find ways to re-embed the market in society. In other words, a new contract between public and private goods. In African cities, you go all over the, over the place, there's an accumulation of cars and private goods in people's uh, homes, and you leave the home and there's just no public goods. And you sit in congestion for two hours, two and a half hours, three hours to get to work. This complete imbalance between public and private goods is a reflection of the continued uh, uh, disconnection of the market from society. But the second challenge is obviously to re-embed the urban in nature, urban by nature. And that's another social contract uh, between our urban and our nature uh, parts of ourselves. So how does this relate to the African challenge that I deal with on a daily basis? As I've already said, we face this massive acceleration of urbanization. We have the fastest ur urbanization rates in the world on the African continent. But we have a very unique pattern of urbanization, and this is somewhat deba debatable uh, in, in academic circle circles, but I hold the argument, which is it's a unique form of urbanization because we've had urbanization without industrialization during a period when inclusion was, was like a bad smell, uh, something you just don't do. So you have an interesting scenario. The culture of urbanism in African cities is quite often winner takes all. You know, the Latinos see cities as works of art. In China, they see cities as a barracks. In Europe, I think you see cities as kind of living museums. Uh, and in Africa, we see cities as casinos. Uh, nobody loves a casino, uh, but it can lead to the accumulation of private goods, but without any significant investment in, in, in what lies beyond the casino. So African cities uh, originated in colonial control and administration uh, and exploitation of resources for elites. To turn that around is a major challenge, but one of the key things that needs to be done is to fundamentally change our conception of urban governance. Right across the board, all the multilateral agencies, most all the development age agencies, almost all the academic analyses assume that the reason we have messed up African cities that just can't get their act together is that you just can't implement the unitary, centrally planned, coordinated conception of urban governance that happened in Europe. Somehow there needs to be a municipality with an integrated network that everybody gets connected together and all other forms are just temporary and, and will eventually uh, 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 move aside the informal service delivery systems, the private service, uh, service delivery systems, the community-based ones, all of these are seen as kind of not quite the real thing. You know, it's a matter of time before we actually just steamroll over all of that and we now build cities as we, as we define cities to be uh, in one particular narrative. And that needs to change. This diversity of delivery systems on Af in African cities is a reflection of a heterogeneity of urbanisms that is the essence of the vibe, the creativity, the vitality of African cities. We are need, going to have to adopt a conception of urban governance that says the diversity of these delivery systems is actually a strength, not a passing phase. And that will give rise to what I would call radical incrementalism. Our conception of urban development needs to shift from blueprinting to radical incrementalism where we use the energies that make a space like Agbo Bloshi in, in, in Accra. So let me end off by saying that if we can make this paradigmatic shift to a diversity of delivery systems, it opens up the space in African cities for innovation. It means, for example, uh, bus rapid transit systems. It means decentralized water and sanitation systems. It's going to mean, above all else, not installing an AC-based grid delivery system. We can do DC now, and we can link those to renewable energy generation infrastructures. It can be done, and with international support, we may well hit our global targets, climate targets. So my concluding sentence is this. Building new modes of city-level uh, city governance based on a commitment to inclusive incrementalism across our diversity of delivery systems will, in my view, address the challenges we Africans face in a rapidly changing global context 
where we are going to have to do some of the ABC of development, but in a resource-constrained and climate-constrained world. If we get this wrong, if we get this wrong, we could make life very miserable, not just for ourselves, but for the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. I'm not going to try and, uh, and, and summarize that, that would be useless, but the main thrust of it is that you see a sort of an outsider interest in Africa which you uh, warn for, and you also warn for a sort of a copying of the way in which we think about progress with a sort of a, a traditional planning tool. But do I also understand that you say that ultimately uh, build more from the informal upwards with the technologies that can help that, like the decentralized electricity generation, but at the same time, make sure you make a big, perhaps traditional planning effort in organizing major infrastructure like sanitation and, and transport. Is that, is the, these are tasks you deserve or do you put at, at the traditional governments? Is that what you're saying? The backbone of infrastructure? Uh, I think some, some, some big decisions are going to have to be made around uh, the big national infrastructure generation capabilities, especially in energy. So, for example, the International Renewable Energy Agency has published a document called the Africa Clean Energy uh, um, was it Route or Pathway the, uh, Corridor, the Africa Clean Energy Corridor which is a remarkable quantification of the huge potential to mobilize all the different uh, geothermal, wind, solar, uh, et cetera, across different parts of the continent uh, to meet our needs. Now, that's a big, massive AU level type, African Union type level decision, which is going to have to be built up from below through co political coalitions. Uh, our country is just making all the wrong decisions. We're building the third and fourth biggest coal-fired power stations in the world. We're going to build another one now, plus a, a fleet of nuclear, and we're going to crowd out uh, the investments in renewables in an area which has got the best radiation levels in the world. Uh, so that's just stupid, okay? So you just don't do what the South Africans do, uh, and, it's, and, and, and that's why we've got growth rates of below 2%. So, so I think uh, 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 big decisions are going to have to be made there. At the city level, I would, I would give much less emphasis to the capacity of planning and much greater emphasis to supporting incrementalism and piece by piece stitching together uh, localized networks that don't necessarily depend on uh, large-scale centralized planning or governance systems because I don't, I'm not that optimistic that you're going to be able to build those quickly enough in Afri African cities, so you need hybrids. And you have to build on the culture of flexibility. The, the key to survival in African cities is learning and unlearning and relearning at a blink of an eye uh, as, you, as you put together assemblages for, for, for daily life. Whether you're poor or middle class, doesn't matter. It's the same basic principles. You've got to build on that, on that social energy. But already we see that these cities, for instance, are getting congested at a, at a very high rate. Is that not a sphere where the government just has to provide the backbone uh, for yeah. mobility? So, so those kinds of big energy infrastructures and the big mobility infrastructures. Uh, so if you go to Nairobi now, the Chinese are building a highway and there's a little bicycle lane next to it. And, and, and in, in 10 years' time, when they finish the project, the traffic will still be going the same speed. Uh, so what's the point? Okay. And, um any, any of the other... Uh, there is an obvious link between what you just uh, said, Mark, and what I'm going to present, because I'm probably much more on the formal institutional side of how cities organize themselves. And I think being European, there's this, always this natural instinct of going back to these big institutions that can you know, roll out these infrastructures where you also say, well, that requires a degree of status, maybe even big energy, big transport. Obviously, there is... Um, a very compelling story, uh, the way you talk about the particular condition in, in Africa. And I, the, what I constantly wonder is, what's the takeaway for the more de developed world if you, um, if you were to translate um, that agenda? And I always get stuck in, 
In questions of time horizon, yes, incrementalism works incredibly well, sort of for tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, even in London maybe, even in Berlin. Uh, so that's one story, and then also uh, the story, uh, an issue of scale. Uh, the incremental story sort of brings you down to yeah, a more humane scale, but you know, that's not only an advantage. Um, and I sometimes fear we have lost the capacity in, in then sort of embracing the incremental uh, story to have uh, an inclusive, um, a uh, sort of democratic process about the big strategic direction we want to move into. But, you know, this is trying to find maybe small little areas of where we could debate. Okay. Mark, you want to respond? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, what, what I'm trying to argue for in the African context is uh, a hybrid. So the, the debate is at the moment polarized between you need to build capacity for planning and governance in the centralized network kind of mode that we all associate with a normal city, on the one hand, versus incrementalism. I'm not arguing that. I'm arguing you have to merge those two together and accept that both will be there. Well, both will be necessary and both will have to be integrated into a conception of governance that is actually faithful to the heterogeneity of urbanisms that will coexist for a very long time in African cities. There is this conception that somehow the formal is going to slowly, slowly steamroller its way across uh, and, and kind of uh, miraculously merge out uh, the informal. Uh, in the context of the numbers that I was talking about and within the context of the resource constraints, I, I can't see that happening. So it's a good thing, actually, to accept a diversity of, of delivery systems mm -hmm. which have to co uh, coexist rather than seeing them as somehow uh, lesser. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's one final question before we uh, move to Yohita's talk. Um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has, has, of course, a development aid program. And until recently, that was all devoted to rural areas. It, was, it had an anti-urban sort of over, overtone. But given your talk and your concerns, what is the one thing that they should not do and what is sort of an advice that would be really where they could make the difference with the money flow that comes from the north? Well, the first thing they need to accept is they're wrong. And it's a fundamental strategic mistake to, to ignore the urban agenda on the African continent in particular. But, or, but yeah, so it, it needs to uh, uh, embrace and connect to the specificities of the, urban, of the urban agenda. Many global programs are closing down their urban programs. So if they're shifting in the urban direction, they, 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 they're going, I think, in the right direction, but it's not where lots of others are going. So I think it's a, it's a good thing, but I, but I would appeal, I would appeal that obviously they have to utilize expertise from this country as part of the program, because that's how uh, aid works. But if you can select the kinds of people who are appreciative of governance dynamics and, the, and complexity in particular, the dynamics of complexity and the multiplicity of urbanisms which have to coexist for quite a long time, it will have much greater traction on the ground. Thank you very much. Yujita, you are about to speak. The floor is yours. Thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, sustain a city, um, and I'm going to try to put this in the context of the Anthropocene. But I will also uh, perhaps echo some of uh, Martin's skepticism about the ability of the city to actually solve environmental problems. Um, essentially what I will discuss is the concept of eco-space, which is environmental utilization space. I will come to the question of cities claiming eco-space and not entirely being able to create the conditions for governing this eco-space. And then I try to think a few, um, make a few suggestions about the transformed city for the 21st century. So if you look at eco-space, then there are a couple of dimensions I'd like to explore. The first dimension is that if you look at metals and minerals, the short-term or medium-term projections are that 
most likely they are going to go down in the coming uh, 10 to 15 years. And perhaps in the future we can explore more, we can take out these resources in a more economically viable manner, but it's all uncertain. But in general, what we can argue is that something like phosphorus, which we need for our food, is going down, and most cities need food, so therefore it will have an impact on cities. Uh, most of us are also using, for example, telephones, and telephones are incredibly important for communication in city life and outside city life. And telephones use rare earth metals, which are also minerals, which are also uh, declining. So we're going to find that these kinds of declining resources will have an impact on cities and city life. The second element of my storyline is the issue of fossil fuels. And essentially, if you want to solve the problem of climate change, then 80% of our fossil fuels will have to remain underground. And that means we are going to come to the situation of stranded resources. And like the first speaker said, um, although there's a huge amount of potential for renewable energy in Africa, right now many African countries are very excited by the prospects that they have discovered oil or gas. And so they're inviting prospectors from other parts of the world, not only Shell, but also Chinese investors, to come and invest. And this is bringing up the dilemma about whether these countries can become rich fast by taking out these resources, or whether in the next 10 years they will become stranded assets. That means they've invested in it, but they cannot use it. So this is from a north-south perspective, a critical issue for many southern countries and also for the cities within these countries which are actually investing in these processes and trying to drive this investment further. Then we come to the issue of land. So there are some resources that are fixed, like land or uh, fresh water availability in the short term. And what you find over here is that whether we talk about agricultural land or land within city or urban areas, it's fixed while the numbers of people are increasing in these areas, especially in the developing world. So the per capita availability is going down, while the demand for using this land for other uses is going up. Uh, let's take water, for example. As people become richer, they want to have golf courses, which take a lot of water. And now we are seeing that water is moving from low price uh, venture. So, for example, having water in a little canal is aesthetic but you don't make money out of it. But if you drain the canal and put it into a golf field, you'll make money out of it. So water is moving from aesthetic to economic uses, and that can also create problems when you have limited water demand, uh, limited water availability. Then if you look in terms of eco-space, uh, with respect to um, ecosystem services, the good news is that these ecosystem services can be continued indefinitely, but only if you use them properly. So if you look at ecosystem services, the first one is supporting, that is supporting the nutrient cycle process. The second is providing, so providing water and food. The third is regulating, for example, the local climate or the local floods. And the fourth is uh, cultural. So if you take, for example, flood services in coastal cities, if coastal cities have actually maintained their mangroves, then they can also make sure that they are less vulnerable to flooding. But many coastal cities are not maintaining those uh, mangroves, and so you find that they are unable to maintain, uh, ensure that their ecosystem maintains um, the process. What you also find is that um, in this process, cities are like parasites, if you like, because they absorb so many resources from all over the world that, in fact, they, they sort of become the center of gravity for all these resources. And that is going to be a problem in the long term. The bad news is that even if we can maintain ecosystem services, we are at present crossing planetary boundaries. And, according to some people, we are, in fact, uh, using one and a half times the Earth annually. And this, for cities, means also that they are overusing their budget, overusing their eco-space. Next slide, please. Okay, so when we talk in terms of uh, shrinking eco-space, we're basically referring to three elements. First, either the resource is constant while the demand goes up, or the sink shrinks. So, for example, the permissible greenhouse gas emissions decreases per year if you want to solve the problem, or the resource shrinks in the medium or short term, whether it's metals or minerals. Now, and the big question for us is whether 
we have the rules to govern this eco-space and whether cities are the appropriate authorities to be able to govern this space. So if you look at cities, they basically are the center of attraction for all kinds of resources coming in, and you get a lot of resources also going out, maybe in, the term of, in terms of gray water or black water, CO2 emissions, solid waste. But the big problem, which is different from Western cities, is the inflow of migrants. And you get both kinds of migrants. You get people who have big, uh, well-paid jobs in big multinationals, but you also have large streams of people coming in from rural areas. And it creates a completely new dynamic and an uncomparable dynamic in these cities compared to here. So I would agree with the first speaker that what we have over here is a growing uh, informality in these cities and you have to find ways to cope with this informality and allow these informal sectors also to play a role in meeting their own needs. Now, we expect that by 2025, 600 cities will earn about 65% of the global GDP, which is going to make them a major actor in the econ economy of the world. And you also expect that the consumption in developing countries will extremely rise in the future. The middle class is also concentrated in cities and they have very conspicuous consumption processes. And in total, we expect one billion new residents in developing country cities in the next, uh, 15, uh, next 10 years. And this basically means that uh, cities can have a major influence on consumption patterns worldwide. It can also have unfortunately a negative influence and this here perhaps I'm going a little bit outside the city if you look at the banks the banks are also concentrated in the world's biggest cities but 50% of bank lending bank lending worldwide is channeled through offshore tax havens so they don't pay taxes 50% of global trade also doesn't pay taxes so what you're finding is that there's a lot of money that is actually trying to find escape routes through the global systems that we have and not pay the risk for the state or for local actors to be able to invest in making their cities more livable, more aesthetic, more environmentally sustainable. If you then look at cities and eco-space, well, cities overuse eco-space, they squat on other people's eco-space. Cities don't know how to share eco-space with others, so uh, everyone tries to take as much as possible into their own area. Cities will be extra vulnerable when there are eco-space problems. And the future city has to learn to deal with eco-space. So I would argue that um, cities can't regulate production, consumption, and distribution processes towards a green economy. They cannot regulate sharing with others, or if they do regulate, they regulate by default. Cities will want to attract industries, and they might also become uh, start to compete with each other and you might have the lowest common denominator. Unfortunately, the regulatory authority, if there is one in a globalizing world, is at other levels. And this brings me to how do we learn in the Anthropocene. So if you have a fairly simple problem, then it's a question simply of trying to... Uh, can you...? <laughs> of trying to improve the routines. And from my perspective of somebody coming from a developing country and living in the Netherlands, a lot of our problems over here seem relatively simple in some ways. Not all, some. But if you have a complex problem, you have to start to reframe how you think about society. But if you have a much more systemic problem, you have to look at the underlying causes. You have to transform the whole way you see things. But this whole transformative process is a thinking process. It's an academic exercise. It's not like you can transform the cities overnight through a blueprint approach. So if you want to look at cities as problem solvers, then one could argue that a city could go green because if city governments uh, engage in public procurement policy, that can influence emissions. Now, that works in rich countries like the Netherlands, and I've seen that having an impact on the emissions. But I'm a little confused as to whether that would really work in some of the developing country cities I've been to because their budgets are so tiny. City governments have spatial planning authority and can influence where windmills are located, where solar energy is used. On the other hand, I used to uh, live with a municipal commissioner because he was my uncle, 
And we used to have to go every morning at 6.30 to see if there was an illegal squatter that had come up in the night. And in the city of Ahmedabad, in those days, the illegal squatters used to build temples because once a temple is built, you can't bring it down. And then that's how the temple would expand overnight. And then uh, before you knew it, you uh, had a, a Hindu-Muslim riot on your hands. So you could not really, you had a different type of problem to deal with. So in theory, they do have spatial planning, but it's not so straightforward. And of course, social actors within the city context can go on a CO2 diet. And I'm not talking about the absolute poorest, I'm not talking about the informal sector, I'm talking really about the middle class and the upper classes. But when you look at cities, they, are, they have to be modest about their role in this whole process. If we have a global problem of shrinking eco-space, then what are the ways we can deal with it? Well, one way is to deal with it through neoliberal capitalism. And that basically means you let the markets uh, price everything, uh, you privatize also resources, and you hope that this will solve the problem at the city level. And very often what you find then is that this empowers the rich. And I think this is probably what you were referring to when you were talking about recapturing, um, recapturing the whole process back. The other alternative is hegemony, and you're seeing a return of the state in many parts of the world, because when you have too little water, countries want to securitize water. They want to make sure that the water doesn't leave their country, and they also want to make sure that they have a role in dividing the water between various actors. Um, but even, even with resources like, for example, rare earths, you find that China has now decided that it's not going to export certain strategic resources because it may need it for its uh, communication sector in the future. But you could also have polycentric governance, and that is a little bit from where the story of city networks comes from. And sure, cities can learn from each other. There are always best practices that you can emulate, but there's a limit. It can't solve by itself the sharing eco-space storyline. And so ultimately, I know that Martin doesn't agree with me because he doesn't believe that there's a cockpit at the global level, but nevertheless, I still very strongly believe in the fact that if we in the Netherlands think that we need rule of law and a, global, and a national constitution within which we can all really enjoy our freedom to be polycentric, I think that's also important at the global level. We do need some kind of rule of law at the global level. We do need a constitution at the global level within which the markets can function, within which states can um, exercise some degree of sovereignty and within which polycentric actors can function. So the transformed inclusive green city, and I think for many of the developing countries, the notion of inclusiveness is really, really important. If about 20% of the population of these cities are in the informal sector, if a large percentage of these people are very, very poor and do not have access to uh, basic resources, food, water, clothing, but even education and health services, you will find that this is going to create a cycle of poverty, of never-ending poverty. So we do have to work on those issues of inclusiveness as well as sustainability in terms of the green elements. So a, sustain a green city is aware of its footprint. It focuses on sharing resources within the city. And so, to some extent, I really feel very strongly that we have to focus not just on governance within cities, but also on government within cities. So that they can invest a little bit in civic amenities and make sure that the street lamps are not just in the rich neighborhoods, also in the poor neighborhoods. That the police are not serving the rich, but also the poor. There's a new trend now for the securitization of the rich people all over the developing world where you find that the rich people have their own security guards because they don't trust the police. This doesn't seem to be, for me, the right way in which we need to move forward. Also, we have to redesign for sharing, not individuality. Cities need to be willing to take responsibility, both for their part in the product chain management, in closing substance cycles, city metabolism, but also they must be willing to share and take responsibility with respect to their footprint, and that means you have to use less because somebody else wants to use a little bit more. City on a diet. Uh, so I would argue that cities, although they are major players globally because in terms of simply their economy, they need to be more modest and less arrogant. They need to be much more focused on trying to figure out how to collectively solve the problems. They need to support some kind of rulemaking at global and national level, and we will need... Um, principles, new principles of the city. I just wanted to end with an anecdote. Um, just to make sure that you understand how different uh, other countries are, New Delhi has just hired a monkey, 
a large monkey called the langur uh, to take care of the small monkeys who are harassing all the cars, um, harassing the cars and the scooters outside the Prime Minister's office in New Delhi. So the large monkey's job is to chase the small monkeys. Um, and that, of course, creates other problems as well. And if you go to Mumbai, for example, unlike people in the Netherlands, uh, you go to work in the morning and then your partner at home, uh, he or she, uh, cooks lunch at 11 o'clock. It gets picked up in your house by uh, somebody on a cycle, who brings it to the railway station and tags it. Somebody else picks it up somewhere else and brings it to your office so you get lunch from home. Cultures are very different in cities. And to try and figure out how to deal with sustainability in all these cities means we're going to get multiple different definitions of sustainability worldwide. Thank you very much. Yohita, you have the advantage of speaking so fast that you could indeed uh, rush through all your uh, slides. Um, and what, what I pick out from your talk is a few things that you don't often hear in, in government circles. Uh, on the one hand, you, you go against the narrative, right? Uh, I, I, I in, invoke a narrative that cities can help solve the problem, but you're actually very skeptical. I am very skeptical because I think uh, um, cities have no power to collect the kind of taxes that are possible to be collected because the very rich in cities in poor countries as well as in rich countries avoid paying taxes. Mm -hmm. Okay, Cities have no powers to actually make rules on multinationals, multinational behavior. They can say where you can build the windmill, so they have spatial planning powers. But there's a very limited uh, role in terms of the municipality's authority with respect to uh, cities. And cities uh, just drain everybody's resources. And another element that wasn't even sort of a, a key in, on your slides, but uh, stays with me, you actually said there is something wrong about the fact that we are promoting a way out of CO2 which leads to stranded assets, particularly in the global south. Ah, what I said was that there's a sharing issue. So if we all have to cut down, this means the U.S. can't frack. It might mean that we have to make space for Kenya and Mozambique to use some of their fossil fuels in the short term. I, it's, a, it's a sharing question. But in fact, if you look at either the UNDP um, um, figures, which say that in 2032 we shouldn't use any fossil fuels at all, and there are others who say by 2050 we shouldn't use, the space and the window of opportunity for them to use fossil fuels is decreasing. But the question is, can, if South Africa uh, develops fossil fuel opportunities now, even if, though it's highly stupid, I can understand their rationality for that. I can't understand that Netherlands does that. Thank you. Why don't you join us again? <laughs> any, any responses from uh, the other <laughs> panelists to uh, your uh, talk? So I think uh, what really does uh, uh, affect changes, what really does result in actual shifts of power on the ground and the allocation of resources is coalitions. So effective coalitions are really about leadership beyond formal power. And I don't mean great leader leadership, I mean leadership in terms of activist coalitions and networks which are behind uh, the formation of agreed understanding, so what should happen. And uh, across the African continent, there's, this, there's remarkable stories all over the place like that. The coalition that resulted in the bus rapid transit system in Lagos, which was built in a year. If you can build a bus rapid transit system in a city like Lagos, you can actually do anything in the world. Uh, and, uh, and it was... Why, were, why did it work? It was a coalition, which yeah. included the unions, some, so, some uh, local social entrepreneurs, yes, some government support, that, that, but that provides you with some regulatory framework, but you have to exploit that and give it content. Mm -hmm. Yes, the African Development Bank and, uh, and some Chinese funding. Uh, but if it wasn't for the coalition of local actors who went and visited BRT systems in other parts of the world, that would not have happened. I, I see so many uh, BIT systems in, 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 in parts of the world that do not function. Yeah, well... They are also built on coalitions, but somehow they go yeah, wrong. Yeah, no, I mean, coalitions is not the panacea. That's, you know, just because you have, you know, thou shalt coalition less and somehow all else will be added unto you. I don't think there is a, an 11th commandment like that. But I think the, uh, in, to get things to work in an African context is, more, is very, very challenging. Mm -hmm. And what matters 
is that you, you, can, you, you have agreements with key actors so you can anticipate more or less what the responses are going to be as conditions shift. So, for example, one of the things they didn't think about was maintenance of the buses. So there's less and less buses on the road now because maintenance wasn't dealt with. Now, that's creating a new set of tensions. But I have a feeling, from what I've understood from uh, people who know about it, is that the coalition is sufficiently strong that they can now address that problem. If it wasn't, then that, the whole system will just go into decline and no, there will be paralysis in figuring out how to keep it going. Nothing you, um, I don't deny anything you say. My storyline is based on the urgency of the Anthropocene. If I believe um, the scholars who say that we are now in the middle of the sixth extinction event, that we are really overusing global resources, then from that perspective you need more drastic measures than you can get through a coalition of people. So I'll give you an example. In the Netherlands we had these projects about trying to convince our fisher folk to fish less because there's a global fish problem. But you know, it, that's really difficult to convince somebody who's grown all his, you know, who's spent all his life learning to fish. Maybe the next generation you can convince. So you can create coalitions at local level to change some things, you can't create coalitions at other levels to create other things. But the biggest problem that I keep hearing about is the fear of lack of competitiveness. The United States argues that we can't take action in specific areas because the Chinese will become more competitive than us. So what you hear is that in many areas, it, the, the coalition you need is not just at the city level, it's at a higher level. So I would agree with you for certain types of local problems, but when you look at the the nature in which we have become completely globalized. Almost all the resources we use in Delhi come from outside Delhi and certainly globally. Almost all the resources we use in the Netherlands also come from outside. And that's why I feel that you're not, maybe not formal power, but you do need some kind of uh, um, uh, bigger storyline to get controls over those systems. But I think you need leadership at all levels. It's clear, I wouldn't disagree with you on that. Yeah, yeah. But just one sentence, I don't think any local coalitions are local coalitions. Okay. Uh, all local coalitions are networked in one way or another to all sorts of very, very complicated uh, non-leafy sourcing money. Okay. Let, let's turn uh, to Philip Rode, because I think one, one thing, Philip, which, which I particularly like about what you have been doing the last couple of years is that I think at LSE Cities you try and do something which I describe as trying to organize a globally networked urbanism. Eh? You liaise through... Uh, the urban age with all sort of cities in the world, and you try and contribute to sort of the knowledge you have generated, collected, and also share it with with policy makers. So, for instance, when uh, I was at your uh, electric city conference, we had a gathering not only of, of mayors but also of uh, leading academics, of stakeholders, NGOs. Uh, the prime minister was there. Boris Johnson was there. I mean, there was. The, and business was there. I mean, the, the big screens we had were, were from and, Simmons. And, and you were there. And came Almost from Germany. Also. We were there, yes. <laughs> so, but um, you're going to present something, but give us also a, a, a sense of how you see the chances of allowing us to learn faster and avoid the mistakes that we, we all now are aware of that we may be um, bound to make. Philip. No Thank you. No pressure. <laughs> no I set pressure. You up in a big way. <laughs> yeah, so this is a moving target. And I mean, this is the formal title of my presentation. I don't have to read it out because it needs to be very different now. I, what I've just heard, number one, uh, there's a debate about the formal contribution of the city as a unit of governing. And I think uh, there are arguments that um, these formal powers of cities are simply not enough, and also the trajectory isn't clear. There's clearly a new emerging narrative about the city as something that provides new forms of network governance, and that's quite promising, probably. I hope that indirectly I'm going to show you a third element where cities are beginning to make a big difference, and that is they're changing a narrative. And they're changing a narrative at the moment, particularly at the national level, interestingly. It provides people who normally don't think in spatial terms, think of macroeconomists, to become rather precise and uh, more illustrative when engaging with the general public about potential futures. So keep that in mind, the creation of a narrative is a very powerful story. Now in my case, it would be great to blow up the charts much better than seeing me talking to them. So if we could have the big screen, please. Thank you. So, um, I mean, I was asked to talk about barriers and opportunities. Uh, initially, I wanted to link this very much to uh, the idea of um, the role of cities in creating 
a, a green economy, and that theme will still be with us. But as I said, I'm trying to make it a bit more um, interactive with what, which, what was already said. Again, could we have the full screen, please? Sorry? It's all set up. Oh, OK. So let's see whether they chose the right images to be big. Um, OK, so th these are two initiatives I've been working in over the last uh, five years. Uh, one thing with uh, uh, the United Nations Environment Program and the Green Economy Report in preparation of Rio Plus 20. The other thing, a very exciting program uh, which is about to be launched, uh, the, uh, a product by the so-called Global Commission on the Economy and Climate uh, and its signature um, climate, new climate economy project. Both of these projects, 10 years ago, would have not had a, f a chapter or even a discourse on cities. Now they do. And in doing so, we are really having a sort of a, col or we, I'm, I'm exposed on a daily basis to this collective recognition that national policymakers, and as I said before, sort of people who normally are informing sort of, sort of the federal level of thinking, the fiscal policymakers, i.e., macroeconomists are discovering the city as a storyline. Why is that? And that's what I'm going to uh, briefly show first, and then I'm also going back to some of the institutional problems we are facing with the city. So this image really would have deserved uh, a, a big screenshot. I'm sorry. So uh, anyway, th th this is Hong Kong. Uh, this is one form of a city. Uh, and it's a, a dramatic contrast, and you know, we need to be careful putting all these cities into one bag to this form of urbanization. And the difference uh, around making also choices which then lead to outcomes uh, between you know, a trajectory path towards a Hong Kong versus a Mexico City path, uh, the, the long-term outcomes of policies that inform these things uh, are hard to overcome with any form of policy. You can be as creative as you want. It's incredibly difficult. Once you are uh, sort of locked into one of those uh, urban pathways, it's hard to get out. And everyone understands this, actually. That's the nice thing about it. So let me just give you a few uh, sort of examples of the dramatic uh, outcome of these spatial configurations. This is fairly basic stuff, but it's important to uh, repeat it uh, because so much uh, is, is dependent on this urban narrative. Here we have a comparison of two cities, similar wealth level, you could also argue similar level of quality of life, Atlanta and Barcelona, very, very different in terms of spatial extent. And as a result, in one place, you have 10 times the carbon emissions from transport than in the other, uh, simply because of the spatial extent of uh, Atlanta and the far greater use of uh, private transport. We have looked extensively at car ownership as an interesting indicator how cities globally perform. You know, if you look at the national level, you have a very linear relationship. The richer you are, the more you drive, the more cars you consume. Not so in cities. If you look at this chart, cities here are the dots, the disks are nation states. If you look at the dots only above 20,000 US dollars per capita, there's zero correlation between car ownership and, uh, and wealth level. So this tells us something about the sort of structural capacity of cities to provide greener lifestyle. Another good exemplary area is heat energy demand, where we modeled for different types of uh, residential housing patterns the heat energy demand, here one extreme uh, in, uh, and another extreme. And we found that purely based on these very basic configurations, you get a factor difference of six in terms of heat energy demand for square meter uh, of living space. Uh, so these structural urban form characteristics matter enormously. Now, the real reason why uh, economics is picking up with the urban story is probably a so-called co-benefit story. And here an overview of some of the most important ones. We talked at the beginning a lot about infrastructure and the so-called uh, requirements for this massive rollout of urban infrastructure. There's actually a massive question mark of how big that rollout is. The World Bank recently did a wonderful study on China looking at an alternative form of urbanization in China, which could potentially lead to saving 1.4 trillion US dollars in infrastructure spending. These are big, big numbers. Um, so that's, at the moment, uh, a huge story for the international community. But let's go to uh, sort of a co-benefit that's related uh, to sort of um, the more social uh, story. And, you know, the evidence is relatively clear that if you go towards more compact, towards more 
green cities, you get massive co-benefits for uh, equity, for questions of health, uh, safety, um, and, and a range of other sort of cost-related factors to the economy like congestion. Uh, so that keeps uh, people really uh, going and, and, and then uh, appreciate this idea. Now, where are the problems? Um, sorry, where, where are then for governance, first of all, uh, the opportunities, and why are we considering cities as a productive context for collective decision-making? Well, here are six uh, sort of arguments which, which are usually put forward. This is not conclusive. There are many more, but let's just run through those very quickly. And the first one um, actually is, is quite important for this idea of the metabolism. Cities and urban governance can, that doesn't mean they, they are, but they can be related better to system boundaries, unlike the nation state, which is sort of an artificial historic uh, uh, boundary. Um, now, that in itself is an opportunity for integrating these different systems. Think of land use and transport, or maybe even health or equity outcomes in relation to urban form. Um, these are clear uh, opportunities we have if we attach political decision-making boundaries to actual system boundaries. Third point, cities are progressive environments, uh, generally more open to behavior change at the individual level, but also at the collective level. Uh, governments are better connected to citizens. You know, the cycling mayor, that image of, or the public transport riding uh, mayor, that's a very powerful uh, image. Um, there are educational environments. You probably know the term of um, sort of negative externalities. Again, something economists constantly use, this idea that you know, one effect of an individual has negative consequences for the collective, which is, are not accounted for. That's actually an experience every urban dweller is very much aware about. Uh, people living in cities know about that, and therefore you can talk about it and make policies around it. And finally, uh, there's something about the city as a unit being understood by almost uh, everyone unlike something like the European Union and other more complicated structures. Now, a bit of evidence to uh, finish this off on uh, what city governments actually do and have achieved so far. We uh, conducted together with two partners, the um, sort of international grouping of, of cities called ICLE, uh, Local Governments for Sustainability, and the Global Green Growth Institute in South Korea. We conducted a survey of city governments in 100 cities Worldwide, And I'm just showing you a few results of that survey. First, um, a big question about how cities assess their green progress to date. And I think this hints at something which we've already heard, which is that cities actually um, uh, you know, can be quite effective in certain areas, but are probably less effective in the most important areas. So yes, there were significant improvements for green space, recycling, water pollution, these kind of areas. You could all also call this low-hanging fruit. But the big ones, greenhouse gas emission, energy security, resource consumption, this is where cities have largely reported to not having made significant progress. Why is that? Well, again, there's a long list of barriers which we can go through or we don't. Um, at the moment, I think I skipped that. But, you know, the many, many different barriers at the generic level. But then there are also barriers which are specifically related to uh, urban governance as we are currently uh, operating it. Uh, cities are very complex, complex systems, and sort of our simplistic approaches to traditional sort of hierarchical, hierarchical governance are, uh, have troubles of dealing with that complexity. We have the diversity of citizens with com conflicting interests, very important, limited autonomy. Nation states often don't grant cities the powers to do anything about these big issues, uh, and then as a result cities are very much constrained with sort of a range of political, institutional, uh, and economic um, f uh, factors here. And finally, that's a big issue and increasingly problematic because of lack of resources, funding, finance. We have heard this already. We are at the forefront of privatizing governance uh, in cities. So final few slides. Um, as a result of all of this, urban policy sectors um, are often not really sectors of urban governance. And that's something we really need to be aware of. There has been a lot of sharing of good practice in areas like transport. That's urban transport is a classic area of innovation for cities. This is where sort of the learning from each other worked quite well because across the board globally, it's an area which tends to be really overseen by local governments, not in all places. India, for example, is an exception on that. But if you move to energy, 
It's a completely different story. This is a photo of the London Array offshore wind park, uh, which has nothing to do with London government or governance. It's a name for marketing. It's actually run by European and um, sort of British level governance with big corporates. That can be very different. Munich, a city that owns its multi-utility company and can, on the basis of that, make big strategic decisions in the long run about electrifying, greening uh, uh, the city system. And finally, and this is sort of, again, staying within the German context, that cities can do it, uh, can do it by themselves is, is close to ridiculous, obviously. The real transformations happen only where you have at least a degree of synchronizing what's happening locally with what's framed by higher tiers of government. Uh, and, you know, whether the sort of um, Germany's energy transition is going to turn out to be uh, a very good example, which I hope it will, ultimately. One thing is clear already. A lot of the innovation we have seen in German cities on the ground would have been impossible without that national level framing, supported also by the European Union, by the way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. I mean, uh, again, a very rich addition to, to our, our, our debate. Um, and the very final point was intriguing. I, I think you, you showed that some cities actually have achieved their energy strategy themselves, and others have not. You compared Munich to, um, to London. What, what did we see, by the way, in, in Munich? It was a, what what, what oh, was that, it? Yeah, it was a wonderful turbine which was implanted into the Isar River to basically generate uh, 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 hydroelectric uh, energy within the city. Mm -hmm. So uh, London couldn't possibly, I mean, this is an interesting question, oh, they probably couldn't possibly put a turbine into the Thames to generate local electricity because they would be in trouble with all sorts of national level agreements with the privatized energy sector. Yeah. So, but the German cities, the Stadtwerke tra tradition, allows them to take charge of their own footprint. Is that also a subtext? Not in all German cities. A lot of them have privatized their utilities, are buying back in, in a few cases. Munich always uh, sort of kept it public, uh, and therefore, yes, and it's the seventh largest uh, utility company uh, in Germany by now. Okay. But, so in the end, your conclusion was uh, we see that uh, na national policy makers discover the city as, 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 as a storyline, and you suggested that basically the city as a unit to organize things is very useful, but in terms of policy making, you need to interconnect with the European Union level, the, the national level, and the like. Yeah, it, absolutely. And I guess sort of one element of, of my argument is that um, what we are hopefully going to see is a much better understanding of what urban and what cities are about at these different levels of government. So I don't think uh, we should rely that sort of the, the cities are going to do it all by themselves, but that we are inducing a fair amount of urban thinking at different levels of uh, strategic decision making. Okay. Is anybody from the government wants to come in on this re-emergence of the city? Because uh, it is striking. Yeah, also in the Netherlands, uh, one of the two guys at the front wanting to say something about that. What you, why it is that national governments suddenly discover the city? Ferdi from uh, the Ministry of the Interior. Good afternoon. Um, well, I'm from the Ministry of Interior, which is uh, very much uh, occupying itself about new boundaries of, of government, so, um, which cannot s uh, solve the problems of interrelating be between all the networks. So we need to move towards excellence in even governance. And excellence in governance uh, is is an uh, operation between different levels and different sectors, and as a more as a kind of a logic, cities are in the in the center of all these networks and all these logics. So we, I think, we have a quite uh, a, a complex identity question for ourselves as a national as policymakers at a national level because we think of these national frameworks in which. We have space for people and, and uh, enterprises and uh, societal uh, entrepreneurs and so on and local government to act. But we are thinking of, of like um, turning everything around and saying, well, it all starts with cities 
their perspective on the global challenges, their perspective on the local resources, uh, their ways of moving forward, which every context is different. And from, from this landscape of, of ambitions, with all kinds of differentiations, we need to find an answer or, like I said, the, the counter mall at the national level, instead of just putting a national framework with all cities in the same size and the same size fits all operations should, should, uh, uh, should respond to. So basically you say you, uh, as, as less hierarchical approach, it's more about facilitating developments in cities. Yeah, a new process, I think, of, of learning and innovation in which I think by, by, by nature, <laughs> uh, local government should reinvent itself in this kind of processes in which it's not local government as usual, uh, business as usual, but reinventing these processes from, a, from, yeah, from I think the urgency of, of a global challenge on the one hand and uh, acting very um, yeah, flexible and, and with urgency now, nowadays in, in doing this learning and innovation processes. So that's very interesting. So the national government has discovered it and Henk Snoeke, you're also active in Brussels because Brussels also discovered the cities. What, what, what do you think the contribution or the, why is Brussels interested in cities? Uh, well, first of all, I, I would like to uh, thank you for the conversation I heard before because I was, uh, we have uh, at the moment uh, uh, an American author, uh, Benjamin Barber, who is, uh, uh, has written a book and has a very good uh, marketing policy, I think I could suggest uh, uh, Martin you uh, perhaps to have a talk with him about how implementing a book. Uh, Benjamin Barkware has read uh, as a... Uh, oh, is, it, what, is there a pun intended in your... <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, he has written a book with the title If Mayors Rule the World and of course his answer is if mayors rule the world, the world would be better and I think it's uh, uh, interesting that um, some outstanding scholars here at the other side of the table are having a bit more uh, kind of uh, a problematic view on that. And so what do you think the Commission is trying to do when, when they turn to cities now? Well, I, I think the Commission uh, sees, as uh, we see it in our ministry, that uh, uh, a lot of the policy problems are um, uh, being found in the cities and a lot of opportunities to face them are also found in the cities. And they tend to uh, think that it is better for them to talk also directly to cities uh, to have an understanding of what, how their policy works, which is the same as we are doing. Perhaps we are a bit scared for that, uh, um, uh, but I think it, it's a good idea. And then, of course, at the other side, uh, uh, you see also a movement of the cities in Europe who want to uh, uh, have their own uh, 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 relations with Brussels. And, of course, this is also a very flat uh, kind of uh, uh, thinking uh, behind it. It's, it's about money and it's about power on regulation in the European Commission. So I think it's a very natural way that they are talking together, but we have to look very well at, at whether it helps or not. So we basically now have a perspective of all sorts of things going on and, and engage the academic community. We have uh, been warned for resources, stranded assets, uh, you know, bits on cities also in the global south for producing solutions that might not work. Uh, we have the, indeed the conclusion that any level of government these days is interested in cities but we still lack John I'm turning to you as uh, sort of the political economy of it all you you wrote a book with an intriguing title uh, offshoring and that is an attempt I, as I see it to say something about how our political economy is turning global and you also have an argument about to what extent it can contract again to cities could you um, contribute at this point to, to this debate, uh, John. <coughs> the floor is yours. Okay, uh, th thanks very much. I was uh, very interested in the presentations that we've uh, heard already. They're very interesting. But I was surprised that one particular expert hadn't been referred to yet. Uh, that's the uh, investor, probably the most successful investor of the 20th century, uh, Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett made a very interesting observation recently where he said, there is class warfare all right, but it's my class, the rich class, that's making war and we're winning. 
And uh, <laughs> I want to explore for a few minutes uh, one particular strategy that that uh, rich class has deployed and which has had very fateful consequences for uh, cities, for governments, uh, for uh, well-being uh, around the world. And this is what I call the strategy of offshoring. We've heard a little bit about offshoring tax. But uh, uh, I think this is a much more general process. And uh, it sort of goes against, with, against the thesis developed, especially during the, the 1990s, uh, the roaring 1990s, as Joseph Stieglitz calls, called them, uh, that the global world was producing a better interconnected uh, set of relationships that were linking people together, that this borderlessness uh, was positive for societies, for people, for friendships, for family life, for business, business opportunities, and so on. But I think that sort of 1990s optimism about, about this sort of borderless world uh, has proved to be uh, a, f a kind of a false storm. And one of the things that uh, character has characterized uh, the last 20 to 30 years has been the growth, not of a sort of borderless world, but of new borders, uh, new secrets, uh, new processes which entail all sorts of uh, phenomena going offshore, out of sight, over the horizon. In fact, one of the things that uh, I, I was thinking uh, arriving in the Netherlands, of course, which has had a complex relationship with the sea, uh, one of the things about offshoring is, is the sort of the, both the physical processes and metaphors of going offshore beyond and the significance of the sea. Uh, as you will know well, uh, three quarters of the Earth's surface is sea. Uh, there are many watery worlds uh, which organise structure, uh, uh, implicate uh, relationships, economic, political, social relationships. And so one of the things I think we should do uh, is to avoid a sort of land centrism in our thinking and uh, analysis that I hope uh, this book on offshoring slightly begins to uh, move beyond uh, this uh, land centrism. And what uh, analysis of offshoring has revealed is that moving across borders are not just nice consumer goods or reasonable sorts of services that we suddenly realize that we now need, uh, but many risks. It's a kind of uh, illustration of a global risk society, to use Beck's kind of terminology. And this is because there are multiple secret worlds of offshored manufacturing work, uh, famously, I suppose, beginning in Shenzhen, uh, of waste, of energy, which we've heard a little bit about, of torture, uh, and other ways in which surveillance takes place offshore, uh, of leisure and pleasure, of CO2 emissions, uh, property ownership, and uh, finance and taxation. And so there are these multiple offshored worlds, somewhat often secret, but not necessarily secret forever, and that they are in very interesting and complex ways inter they're most sort of starkly interconnected if one thinks of some of the uh, Caribbean island, which is a, maybe a tax haven, in fact, specifically uh, produced as such by, as a development strategy, uh, notoriously by the City of London, uh, which has played a dire uh, role in much of this. And of course, it's also a place of leisure and pleasure. And uh, uh, many tax havens have nice beaches, uh, as well as all sorts of other forms of expertise. So for me, offshoring uh, is tremendously problematic. It's kind of an extra, extra burden 
on top of the other problems that uh, our colleagues have referred to, because it involves moving resources, practices, peoples and monies from territory and moving them within what are often called secrecy jurisdictions. It's a sort of technical term. And it involves evading rules, laws, taxes, regulations, norms. It's, around, it's, it's about getting round rules that are either illegal or unethical, or using laws in one jurisdiction to undermine those in another. And uh, this has been made possible by uh, the sort of coalescence of some of the infrastructures that we've just been uh, seeing pictures of. Uh, there are a set of tremendously powerful infrastructures that have kind of remade uh, the contemporary world. Uh, Container-based cargo shipping, uh, where the largest uh, container ships now, uh, the triple E cargo uh, ships from Maersk, could now take 18,000 uh, uh, 18, uh, containers. Uh, aeromobility, uh, especially private jets and private aircraft. Uh, the internet and new virtual worlds, uh, car and lorry traffic, and lorry traffic obviously very interconnected with the uh, containerization process. New electronic money transfer systems, very useful if you're trying to launder money or move money that has been gained illegally or if you're trying to avoid or evade taxes. Uh, there's also the kind of de de uh, de development of taxation, legal and financial expertise, which is specifically oriented to the avoiding of national regulations. And then there is just huge amounts, as we know, of both legal and uh, illegal movement across borders. So this offshoring world I see as a kind of ecosystem, uh, reorganising economic, social, political and material connections between cities, between societies. Uh, and indeed some cities, we've talked rather generally about cities, but some cities are specialists in offshore, or in offshoring. Uh, the, the particular site that intrigues me particularly is Dubai, which went, has gone from one of the poorest places on earth over 40 years to be uh, the eighth uh, most visited city in the world during the 2000s. It was said at one stage to have more cranes than anywhere else, maybe apart from Beijing. Uh, and uh, it uh, is a, a place of leisure and pleasure, and it's also a major tax haven. And many of the, the sort of, the, some of the cities that we've seen images of are also functional, of course, including the city of London, uh, part of Delaware, where there's a building in Delaware which uh, houses, which is the headquarters of 217,000 companies. Uh, in, some place, in some ways, that is the largest building in the world. But of course, it's a minor, tiny building, it's not a big building, it just has a lot of, lot of brass plaques we would say. Um, and so this global, so the global order for me within which the cities are struggling with these multiple and many issues and problems is the opposite of an open world. It's one of concealment, mainly orchestrated in and for this uh, rich class. And uh, in particular, the movements of finance, income and wealth into the world's 60 to 70 tax havens. Uh, a quarter, about a qu at least a quarter of the world's societies, and some of which are very special societies. They're kind of islands, which are sort of both cities and islands simultaneously. And these have become tremendously significant and are part of the neoliberalizing the world economy from around 1980. Uh, the first act of the, more or less the first act of the Thatcher government was to eliminate uh, exchange controls and thus enabled much greater flows of uh, foreign exchange and other forms of uh, income and wealth to take place. And just one or two little figures here. Uh, offshored money has increased from around 11 billion, 11 billion US, tr uh, US dollars in 1968, in the revolutionary year of 1968, that one or two of us remember, uh, to... Uh, to uh, now 
21 trillion US dollars. And that is equivalent to about a third of world GDP. And it's thought that a fewer than 10 million people currently own this uh, 21 trillion offshore fortune. And the growth of that offshore fortune has very dire consequences, has dire consequences for democracy and development, as noted earlier, and I think had very dire consequences uh, for the development of a uh, low carbon future. Because, of course, these are forms of uh, ownership, mobilization, wealth, and power of high net worth individuals and. Uh, companies, almost all major companies holding uh, offshore accounts of various sorts which are specifically about concealment uh, and as a consequence of that uh, there, the, the possibilities of forming sustaining a kind of low carbonism in which we are all in it together is uh, a pipe dream Well thank you very much John I'm, I'm going to do it. So now we've got the full set. Pardon? Now we've got the full set. Oh, full set, full set, yeah. I mean, because I believe in the positive story about cities, but only if we take all these issues into account, you see. Um, because otherwise it is just uh, city optimism. So what you add to the conversation, you... you do I understand you right? You say the, the, the fact that so much capital is offshore, that there is an infrastructure of offshoring, is a threat to that ideal of a sustainable city? Uh, yeah, I was exa exactly saying uh, that. And uh, what would be necessary would be to imagine, and in, in the, the last chapter of this book, I have a discussion of what I call reshoring. Uh, there are little bits of... Uh, evidence and material which have sought to uh, develop strategies uh, to reshore, which partly involves things, for example, the European Union in relationship to uh, uh, what's called country-by-country country tax taxation uh, of corporations. But, uh, of course, that's going to be massively difficult to uh, implement. Uh, I've also written quite a bit about the possibilities of uh, so-called 3D printing, manufacturing through 3D printing, additive manufacturing, and that whether there are possibilities of relocalizing manufacturing so that manufacturing was, was to be re-established kind of down the, along the high street. Uh, and there are other things to do with uh, waste, uh, there's the proximity principle relationship to waste, that waste should be disposed of as close as possible to where it has been generated. And of course there is a huge uh, uh, polit new politics of taxation, which I think has been a pretty significant uh, thing in which actually uh, academics and policy makers have, been, have dragged their heels and the really significant things has been direct action. Uh, by uh, NGOs, by charities, mm -hmm. and by the uh, uh, UK uh, Uncut Movement, Occupy Movement, and so on, which has tremendously transformed, I think, some of these uh, issues. Yeah. No, so, but it's obvious that there is an incredible power outside the conversation. At the same time, uh, we, we hear uh, in your talks the possibility of much more sort of city inclusive thinking. Uh, several times appreciate informal settlements, don't regard them as a problem. Um, I mean, is this, is there, is, is this whole s smart city proposition and the idea that we need a, a big, a very big investment, is that, is that, is that the wrong sum, Mark? Is that, is that some fair or do you think that we have to not think about it as in terms of the big investment like Jeremy Rifkin, eh, who thinks about it as a sort of a third industrial revolution. Is that, is that a, a cognitive mistake? Uh, no, I mean, uh, it's not a, a cognitive mistake. I think these, uh, we're talking about flows of capital, resources, people at different levels. Um, so uh, I, I hear what John is saying. Uh, but at the same time, the, uh, one of the 
uh, negative consequences from the point of view of the investors of this massive concentration of capital in these havens is that they're struggling to figure out where to put this money. Uh, uh, it doesn't just sit there because you, money doesn't, it's not allowed to sit. It has to go to, into places and generate interest rates uh, in virtually zero or negative interest rate environments where it used to be uh, is looking for outlets in places where actually there is growth. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting that Barclays Bank has decided in its restructuring after it should have gone to jail that Africa is now a priority. Uh, it's like a big strategic priority for Barclays Bank and they're shutting down all their funny businesses that have got them into trouble. Um, why? Well, they're looking for outlets for cash. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and where are those outlets? A lot of them are being configured in these, in these environments where if you follow the advice of Siemens, well, set up your city for investor ready so that the money that John is putting a magnifying on, on is going to go into these places and create elite enclaves and long-term property developments that yeah. have all the negative consequences. An alternative coalition, I think, can actually talk to those financial flows because some of them are actually fairly politically neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you can uh, have discussions with certain funds, with certain investors, for certain controllers of capital to say, well, actually, yeah. your investment in more inclusive infrastructures might actually be safer. Okay, well, let's explore that issue a bit. I mean, are there alternative coalitions to build where uh, businesses can earn money and we still can solve public problems? Isn't it? So maybe let's stick to this um, narrow but very important perspective of um, you know, foreign direct cap investment capital that's uh, looking to uh, create returns. A story which we constantly pick up, that particularly in the sustainable uh, urbanism space, the, the problem which in, the institutional investors have if they go to these environments, and you know, they are even, they, they are good willing and they like the idea of maybe doing something good, the stuff isn't bundled enough yeah. that it's worth their investment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what they'll typically tell you is, you know, something which is below 200 million isn't even worth going because, yeah. you know, the, the amount of the, the cost for just setting it up, it, it, exactly, that's not worth doing. So we need to find a mechanism where, going back to this idea of the incremental approach, where while doing it incrementally, you can still do it and scale it up. So there is, you know, some pension fund saying like, great, we're going to put here 500 million or even a billion on the rollout of a sustainable transport system, which is then probably not only in one city, but which is in 10 cities at the same time. Um, so someone needs to take care of that. And so my question would be, who is the bundler in the incremental story? Yeah. John, do you want to also respond? Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, those are very interesting uh, points. Um, uh, I mean, uh, I do notice, though, that uh, Barclays uh, uh, has about 400 subsidiaries. And one of the things that is fantastically problematic for citizens is knowing how a particular entity operates. Yeah. And most of these entities have many uh, subsidiaries. Uh, there's something in the uh, com uh, company in the Caymans called Caymans 37. It's actually more or less the, uh, the, 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 the profits of uh, BP, uh, for example. Uh, and, it's ca it, there's this, and, and you can't find that out. You can't go to cable to find that. So there's all sorts of forms of uh, kind of sets of relationships which, which conceal and confuse that. But I was also going to say another thing about uh, offshoring is of course being the, not only the sort of relocating of bits of manufacturing, large amounts of manufacturing offshore in, a, in other societies, but the fragmentation of the manufacturing process. Yeah. And so when, that's why the companies can't in a way find a great big bundle to spend their money on because of course any any new uh, significant investment will tend to be made up of different elements and that's true for both sort of profit reasons but also reasons to do with sort of how socio-technical systems are formed yeah. and now operate and you have to kind of in a sense uh, it affect an assemblage of different components uh, from many different uh, places. But, but, so the, but, but still, the, the, the search is for unusual coalitions. Yes. Because states can't do it. We also seem to agree that cities can't do it. And, 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 and if mayors rule the world, we wouldn't be necessarily in a better place. 
So we have to sort of explore the conditions under which these new coalitions can uh, shape up and, and produce the sustainability politics that we so dearly need. So, Yogita. So I'd like to come back and answer your question. I think that coalitions can work and they can argue against uh, uh, big finance if the subsequent contract that is made on the infrastructure is made open. Right now, all uh, in, uh, contracts are secret. And if I look at the water world and I look at the climate change world, say, for example, the clean development mechanism, there's a lot of discussion, coalitions, approvals. Everything is in the open air. When that contract is made, it disappears completely into secrecy. You look at emissions trading. Holland bought uh, emissions from Latvia. Okay, That whole contract is secret. We won't pay the, uh, we won't return the credits if they didn't do the, use the money in a particular way. We can't even see what it says. The problem is the secrecy in the contract. So if we can ensure that these contracts are not completely secret, then maybe the coalitions have a better role, both influencing the process up front and also afterwards. Okay. Let me see if, if somebody from the audience would like to uh, come in. I, I looked occasionally in the hope that somebody would uh, have a question. Um, is there somebody who would uh, have a question? Caroline, can somebody give a mic to the lady in the middle there? Perhaps you can stand up and say who you are. Um, my name is Caroline van Denis. I work for the, the Dutch Enterprise Agency, which is part of the Ministry of Economic Affairs. And there, uh, they are trying to act as a bundler, at least for a green energy projects, because I also do a project with 13 different banks in Holland on natural capital, and they have this complaint about the projects are too small. So yeah. at least as a government, we are now trying to be a bundler. I'm not really sure whether we are the right uh, actor to do it or whether we are successful, but... Um, uh, maybe that's, you know, learning from one another is important. So I was just trying to give that. I, I was told that pension funds are not going to uh, invest in the offshore windmills in the Netherlands, is that? Because that would be, uh, I mean, we can't bundle uh, in bigger parts than... Uh, well, that's, that's not small projects. The offshore wind is like the big project. So I'm not really sure what's wrong in the contract there. But um, the small projects is, for example, the local decentralized energy agency uh, enterprises that are now uh, starting. Okay. So the national and, uh, government is taking a role in doing trying the to bundle. Effort. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, great. yeah. And another thing is that you see that more banks are becoming, but that becoming interested in setting up funds for uh, um, people doing um, um, green and social good. Uh, projects within cities. So there is some, but, but there, 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 a new financial kind of infrastructure is needed to mm -hmm. make that kind of investments possible. Yeah. So are there other issues from the, from the audience? Yeah. Over there, the gentleman ten rows down. My name is Diego Mora, I come from Colombia and I work for uh, an agricultural company in the Netherlands. And I simply was wondering how do you see the relation of the cities uh, with the uh, rural areas uh, around them? I have not heard much about it in, in your talks. Thank you. So perhaps that, let's return for a moment to that urban metabolism. Um, any of the panel members would like to come in on, on that one? Uh, okay, I want to come to that, but I just want to come back to your earlier point about bundling, this earlier yeah. issue of bundling. I think a, there's, a, a, there's a new set of players on the African continent which are sovereign wealth funds. Uh, Angola, uh, Ghana, various other places are, are, are following uh, the Norwegian example of setting up a sovereign wealth fund to capture the resource rents as a result of the resource boom which is driving economic growth. And those, potentially, because they're public uh, controlled, but they quite often have private sector uh, transaction managers, could play a significant role in bundling. And I think we should actually pay a lot more attention. I've been scouring the global community for research projects on sovereign wealth funds. I don't know if John's know, know any, but I think that would be something really interesting to look at and, and track the Norwegian one. Uh, just the problem within unequal societies is that if you sit on a pot of cash, there's a whole bunch of claims on those funds for short-term demands. So that's 
But the, the, on, the, on the urban metabolism and the peri-urban, uh, the big issue on the African continent is uh, at the moment there's still fairly quite strong rural urban linkages in terms of uh, regional food production feeding local urban markets. That's under threat as a result of South African supermarket chains that are uh, parachuting into African cities and, 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 and uh, ring-fencing the middle-class spend and disconnecting those markets from uh, rural hinterlands, re regional food production networks. And that has got supermarketization is a major, major threat to that urban metabolism. Just, just speak, I think. Hello, yes. Uh, my name is Marjolein Wilmink and I'm uh, working for uh, CSR Netherlands, MVO Nederland. And uh, we are actually currently working on coalitions of, of enterprises that are looking at new urban paradigms and, and the way they could play a role and export also a bit of the Dutch knowledge in, in, in being actually an urbanized uh, country. But my, I have actually more a remark about it, so this, this, is, this is a general introduction from me, but I used to work with um, uh, bigger international urban programs uh, with Asian Coalition of Housing Rights, Shack Dwellers International, you probably know it also. <laughs> very uh, well-known uh, international uh, uh, coalition of urban poor. And what they are experimenting with, and I think Bangkok is also a nice example, is that they have urban funds. And the urban funds are actually not only um, being created by multi-stakeholder groups, so being governments, being uh, poor coalitions, being enterprises, private sector, but they are also governed by these people. So if you talk about who's bundling, then coalitions can also bundle themselves. And, and, and it's all about um, who's governing resources. So who's making plans? That's one thing. And, and so far, uh, I think cities have never been able to go beyond making plans in a coalition form. But if you also jointly govern the resources, then you're getting somewhere. Okay. And uh, Shack Dwellers International is also doing that in international contexts with a huge global urban fund. And that is actually a new way of also looking at uh, governing cities, I think. Okay. And, and the, 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 the money in the fund is coming where, from where? From all these stakeholders. So okay. everybody is putting money in. So it's not about uh, people are claiming governments to uh, solve the problem, but it's kind of we put all the money in. So private sector, governments, uh, civil society and people themselves. Okay, yeah. thank you. Philip. I, I mean, I, I just want to use this example where, where I sometimes feel you're then through the back door ending up in the long run with something which is fairly, you know, institutionalized. And it begs the question, why do you want to then give up on the structure which you, you know, sort of have already in place from the beginning? I think that there are probably contexts where this is the right strategy. Where you say, let's just, let's just forget about what the constitution is trying to do. Let's just forget about how the formal city charge and, you know, all of this. We'll, we'll do it from the side and build it up. And, you know, eventually in 20, 30 years, you know, this new territory be becomes the new city governance. Yeah. Um, but I think one needs to be also careful and understand where do these alternative forms further corrupt the formal structure. And then I think it can be very counterproductive. Uh, where, you know, even the outcome in the medium term is then one where, where uh, you, you, you are failing to see the overall improvements you'd like to enhance with those kind of actions. Because you're giving up too soon with regards to what has already been put in place. Thank you. It's time to round up uh, our, our uh, little uh, conference here uh, uh, on the stage. Um, let's see if we can uh, formulate a takeaway. What is what is something you take away from this from this interaction? Um, I'm giving. I'm going to talk for two more sentences to give you ample time to to think, and I will uh, look who is the first to look at me, uh, yeah. and that's Mark. Mark. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, what's the takeaway for you? I mean, it may also be sort of what's the agenda that we should be uh, investigating in the in the future years. Well, in these kinds of conversations, you'll always have somebody like sitting at the back saying, uh, grassroots mobilization, ur urban poor funds, the, the people making things happen. And someone like John saying there's this massive accumulation of power, secretive, 
uh, and there's not much, uh, there are pipe dreams as a result. Uh, we have to, I don't, we, we have to work with those beyond the dualisms. We have to work uh, in our analysis uh, with both. The one can't trump the other, one can't trump the other. And I think for me, the, um, as I often say in some, in some environments where there's actually no basis for any hope, uh, is that uh, Martin Luther King didn't say, I have a nightmare. <laughs> and uh, you don't mobilize people on nightmares. And I think that uh, we, have to, we have to find that, that, that balance. And I think it's possible within the environment of cities, which is why we find them magnetically attractive to, to, to stay worrying about. Right. Okay, so an, an, optimi an upbeat uh, note from you, uh, Philip. Yes. Um, I, th th I think the first is a direct reflection on what we talked about. Um, and probably sort of John triggered that tho thought uh, most directly. We, we're currently seeing, and you know, I'm also a bit informed by having attended Thomas Piketty's lecture at the LSE on Monday. But um, th this, this, is, this is big. There's something which at the moment is actually bigger than sort of the environmental story, and that's these huge concerns about social inequality. Uh, and these are also concerns and pressures felt by, in, in some countries, by at least a cultural elite, certainly not a financial elite, but a cultural elite. And I think if, if the environmental agenda fails to connect with that new emerging um, conversation around global equity, uh, we are running an enormous risk. Because I, I, I can also see, I mean, the corporate world is in some areas more lined up with some of the low carbon environmental story. They're struggling much more with the offshoring, with the inequality story. And I think we need to avoid uh, to, to separate out the two. So that's, that's a very uh, meta level uh, view I, I, that just sort of emerged. The other one is, uh, was triggered, um, Martin, by your introduction and I think the theme also of the Biennale is this sort of uh, urban by nature. Uh, and I have two views of how we should deal with these terms because on the one hand I think it's important to protect urbanity also from nature and not to, you know, and for me the, the symbol is very much a city where the periphery merges slowly into nature and where you can't really separate out what is, what is urban, what is nature or rule. I actually think in, in the world we're moving into, it's probably helpful to be much clearer about creating strong boundaries or, and strong sort of differences between the two. But that is not to say that cities are not deeply embedded into ecosystems and part of them and, and are natural by themselves. But there's a difference maybe between rule and natural which we need to work with. Okay, cool. Here you go. Um, last week I did my third inaugural speech and that was on sharing our eco space and so uh, very much in line with what you said for me it's really important that um, uh, northern cities are willing to be more modest about their footprints and make some space for southern cities to increase their footprint at least in the short term that doesn't mean that southern cities should not try to drastically find a different route to development than northern cities so I see that also as a critical issue for developing countries. Um, I was very encouraged by hearing that you said something about uh, city dwellers being aware of their negative externalities. And I think in, in, to the extent that I play loud music, my neighbors find that offensive. But when we have discussions, then they always have their big cars, and they're always asking why the Brazilians cut down their trees. And I keep saying, but you have your big cars. And we just get stuck in that dialogue. So you know, in some areas, people are aware of their negative externalities, but in other areas, they're not. And this is not just a story in the Netherlands. In when I go back to go home to India, it's the same story. People think, oh, we've got the water, let's, let's have 10 baths a day because it's 45 degrees and we need to have it, but there's not enough water for that. So I, I feel that the negative externality story needs a much stronger film, a uh, much more push, and maybe we need to frame it more positively. Maybe we need to find a better way to explain it to people, a better storyline. Thank you very much. Joel? Uh, yeah, uh, well, I... The, the, collect, the connections between uh, global inequalities and climate change, uh, as, and of course the, the global inequalities as reflected in cities, and many cities are places of extreme inequality and enhanced inequality. 
So, and uh, in the uh, State of the World report, it says the world's richest 500 million people, which is 7% of the world's population, are currently responsible for half of the world's carbon dioxide emissions, probably all of us in this room. Uh, <coughs> while the poorest 3 million are responsible for just uh, 6%. So I think the, the profound interconnections of global inequalities, inequalities which are enhanced and developed by many urban developments, not all urban developments, there are some great places which have kind of struggled against that, but in which cities play a significant role and are then uh, you know, centrally implicated in uh, that, uh, those uh, forms of uh, carbon emissions uh, on a phenomenal scale, and so uh, unlike uh, I have a, unlike the thesis, I have a dream. I, actually, I think many many writers now have have and are having uh, many nightmares. <laughs> okay, well, very encouraging to hear. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, actually, what we did today was we we did a, a tour the horizon in a very big way. We took the, the city story globally. We discussed how on all levels of government we now talk cities with the big advantage that we are probably very close to people's experiences and people's daily lives are in cities to a large part and will be increasingly so. That's a big advantage I think when we talk about cities we see cities as a site of hope. Cities have always been the site of change, that's for sure. That's where value change occurs first. And whether that's going to be enough, we, we will see. But it is really important that it is a topic. I like the way in which we could easily connect here the urban by nature metabolism discussion with all the layers of finance, of business, of governance, of, of global change and of, of connections. And above all, I suppose, the story about how can we learn our way out of it by not avoiding difficult questions, but actually by addressing them. That's, I think, what we have uh, done. I would like to thank very much the panel members for their contributions, and I give them a big hand for your help. Um, and before I invite you to, to, to the drinks, I would like to... Uh, do something which is a uh, sort of uh, a pragmatic book launch. I would like to invite uh, two gentlemen on the first uh, uh, row, uh, Hank Snooker and Ferdi Ligier, who are responsible for knowledge uh, in respective departments and, and definitely also uh, uh, working their way into cities. Is there somebody from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the room? Ah. Um, the, the, the thing was that they were all abroad, so the, uh, <laughs> which is foreign affairs, but foreign affairs is, has to come home. So I would like to give you two, as well as the, uh, the members of the panel, a first copy of this book. It's designed by a catalog tree in Arnhem. It is a collective effort of PBL. You've, you, it started with me offering George and Dirk Simons uh, to offer good statistics for a Biennale. But if you have a good scientist, you know, what good statistics is, is, is quite a thing. I was told that some of the infographics that are in this book went up and down 15 times before uh, PBL was satisfied that they conveyed the right story. And, and the only thing as academics, we know that there will be mistakes left that were unaddressed and we are going to find. But let me give you <laughs> a copy each uh, in the hope that it will inspire you and inform you in, in you know, putting that city agenda together. I think it's a crucial move from the government that they got back into city. So, Hank, first copy for, for you, and the same first copy for you, Ferdi, so please. And I'm going to give you a third one to pass on to the colleagues from Foreign Affairs, because they need to do more with cities. And then, John, thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you. Yoita, thank you very much thank for you. your comp thank you. contributions. Philip the same. Here you go. Thank you. And Mark. Please. You. Here you go. Much awaited. Well. <laughs> Thank you all for your uh, attention and
one, one moment, this is the, the second symposium we did. Um, PBL is a, is a wonderful uh, agency and one, one I, I, find, I find a delight to be able to, uh, to lead it for a couple of years. But one of the things we are particularly good at is, is the way in which we organize things so that I can uh, focus on content. Simone, Marjolein, and Mirjam, who have uh, worked on this very hard. Thank you very much for that as well. Some drinks are downstairs.